Greetings. My name is uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, Jr., and uh, I work at the Cleveland Clinic, where I uh, retired from surgery after uh, 30 years as a general surgeon, where I was, my primary responsibilities were chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force and head of the section on thyroid and parathyroid surgery. But somewhere along halfway through my career, I became increasingly disenchanted. Uh, with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was doing nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. This kind of led to a bit of a global research to try to clarify if there were other cultures where breast cancer was less, less frequently identified. And lo and behold, it was apparent that in places like Kenya, uh, breast cancer is 30 to 40 times less frequent than the United States. In rural Japan in the 1950s, Breast cancer was very infrequently identified, and yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States, by the second and third generation, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. And perhaps most compelling in the cancer regime was cancer of the prostate. In the entire nation of Japan in 1958, autopsy proven, how many deaths from cancer of the prostate? Eighteen. That was pretty mind-boggling. By 1978, they were 20 years later, they were up to 137. But that still pales in comparison to the 28,000 who will die this year or uh, in, the, in the United States of the cancer of the prostate. The common denominator there was the fact that these cultures by heritage and tradition were plant-based. So in my crazy dream, it seemed that how would it be if we could get people to eat to save their heart and at the same time, save themselves from the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and pancreatic. And that was what sort of launched my interest uh, halfway through my surgical career in nutrition, along with uh, reading some books by Nathan Pritikin and uh, my uh, friend uh, John McDougall and the McDougall Plan, which uh, really sort of spirited me that there might really be something to this. The reason I focused on heart disease was I said I thought I could get much more rapid results. Uh, and here was the most, com this was a disease that was actually the number one killer of women and men in Western civilization with cardiovascular disease. And it would really be a lot of bang for the buck if we could show within maybe 12 months or 24 months, or even shorter, that maybe there was some possibility of either halting this disease progression or perhaps, uh, how about even reversing it? I uh, talked with my wife, and after she and I had done this for a year, I felt it was time to go to cardiology and see if I could get maybe 24 patients. And uh, I, they graciously uh, let me speak to the department, and they were, <laughs> and over the next uh, 18 months, I got these 24 patients. They had failed their first or second bypass. They had failed their first or second angioplasty. They were too sick for these procedures, or they had refused. And there were five who were told by their expert cardiologists they would not uh, live out the year. The rock upon which this study was most likely to flounder would be lack of patient compliance. Because here you were taking something that is almost as personal as religion and sex is food. And you were going to make a very significant change. So for that first study, the way we dealt with compliance was I sort of grasped the mantra, the same mantra for these patients that I'd used for my cancer patients. And that mantra I had learned from a West Coast surgeon years ago for whom I had great respect. His name was Bert Dunphy. And Bert used to say that patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer. And patients with cancer are not afraid to die. But patients with cancer are afraid of being abandoned by their family, or by their physician. So for the, for the first um, five years of this study, I asked these patients, they were all sort of local and regional ones, they could do this, to see me every two weeks in the office. And I would go over every morsel they ate, and we would drew their, we drew their cholesterol, and we checked their weight and their blood pressure. And uh, we'd sit down and have a chat and talk about things, and so we, uh, we got to know each other pretty well. And then by the end of uh, five years, I got bold and I stretched it out to every month, every four weeks. 
And then at the end of a decade, they were pretty well by this time on autopilot, so then we, uh, I stretched it out to quarterly. But, uh, and then it was interesting to, uh, to see how they were doing it, and it was very exciting to, uh, to see a number of striking examples of how, not only how they halted their disease, but we did some metrics to find out that they were actually reversing their disease.